My name is Paul Hooper. I come from the uh, Santa Fe Institute. And today, what I'd like to do is introduce the following thesis. That the specialized niche occupied by Homo prior to the advent of agriculture fostered a set of core social relationships based on kinship, cooperation between men and women, and reciprocity. And that these social relationships are fundamental for understanding unique aspects of human biodemography, including extraordinary lifespan, menopause, and an extended period of development. Now, what are the features of this specialized foraging niche? First of all, we can look at the difference in diet between human foragers and our closest primate relatives, the, the chimpanzees. What we see is despite many shared features between our two species, that our diets are, are radically different. That while chimpanzees subsist primarily on easily, easily collected food items, that human foragers uh, maintain the majority of our diet, uh, obtain the majority of our diet through extracted resources and hunted resources, which require high levels of skill development and learning early in life, the consequence of which is that we have an extraordinarily late age peak in caloric production, uh, often in, the, in the, the 40s or 50s for uh, the hunter-gatherer groups for which we've, we've uh, gathered data, and high complementarity between male and female inputs to production and reproduction, that is specialized sex roles, and particularly high gains to cooperation in both uh, production of resources and in risk reduction, sharing of resources after production. The dominant pattern of relationships, which I'm emphasizing in this talk, are illustrated in this slide. This slide shows, first of all, a pattern of net downward resource transfers from older to younger generations, from parents to offspring, but also grandparents to grand offspring. Uh, cooperative relationships between men and women within marital unions. And bilateral reciprocal relationships, both between kin and non-kin. Um, and when these are between kin and, and across generations, these tend to be imbalanced relationships, meaning that there's again a net, a net flow from the older to the younger generation. And what I'd like to do in the rest of this talk is to, to take each of these types of relationship in turn and introduce some insights that we've gained through evolutionary economic models and present data from the study of human foragers and, and forager horticulturalists. And I'll, I'll draw particularly heavily on data from our, our field site with the Tsimane. Um, so, first, to, to start off, and in order to understand the basis of intergenerational transfers in the traditional human context, um, I'd like to think through the, the application of Hamilton's theory of inclusive fitness uh, to the life history of production as it's been documented uh, among hunter-gatherers. If you remember, Hamilton's rule specifies that an altruistic act will be favored by selection when the, the benefits <coughs> to the recipient uh, devalued by the, the coefficient of relatedness exceed the cost to the donor. And what we, can under, what we can do is ask how this curve, that is the uh, net productivity of an individual across life, this orange curve uh, here as a function of age, creates systematic differences in the costs and benefits of giving calories across life, uh, that is net transfers across life. And so humans show a remarkably long period of net caloric dependency or, or net caloric deficit. That is, uh, while uh, children begin to, to produce some calories from an early age, uh, caloric productivity does not exceed consumption rates until relatively late in, in the second decade of life, around 18, uh, 20, 22 years of age. Um, so this is a period in which 
individuals are not producing enough to meet their own caloric requirements, and they'll therefore receive a large uh, benefit from receiving calories. Uh, that is, the, the marginal benefit of calories are higher for them um, because they have fewer calories that they've produced on their own. As individuals uh, grow up, as they gain the skills that are necessary to be a competent hunter-gatherer, uh, production continues to increase across the 20s and 30s. Um, and adults in most hunter-gatherer societies produce large net caloric surpluses. Um, what this ends up meaning is that you're producing much more food than you'd ever need, be able to consume on your own. And so the, the costs to you for giving a calorie away uh, are, are much less than if you were in this, this earlier phase of life. And so what ends up happening is that as you move through life, that the, the B's and the C's, the benefits and the costs in, in Hamilton's equation are shifting systematically, leading to systematic redistribution of resources from older generations to younger. From this theory, we can make the following predictions regarding the direction and volume of net transfers in traditional human societies. First of all, that net transfers between generations will tend to be downward. Second, taking seriously this, this <coughs> synthesis of Hamilton's theory together with the life history of production, that the interaction of caloric need of donors, that is the kind of the inverse of net productivity, how, how far into the hole are you? The interaction of caloric need of donors with relatedness will be negatively related to the net amount transfer. That is, the more productive you are and the less you need to consume or the less that your family needs to consume, the easier it will be to give calories away. Conversely, we can predict that the interaction of the caloric need of recipients with relatedness genetic relatedness will be positively related to the net amount transferred. That is, the more uh, urine caloric need, uh, and the, given that we're related, the more calories will flow from me to you. So these are our testable predictions. Um, these are what uh, the, the data look like for both gross and net food transfers among the Simon A for a a uh, hypothetical family of typical demographic composition. Um, and what we see is that while uh, on the left side you can see that gross transfers among most individuals within the, the extended family go in both directions, that when you take the, the gross in one direction, you subtract it from the gross in the other direction to calculate the, the net flow, that you indeed see net flows from parents to offspring from grandparents to grand offspring and from grand grandparental generation to adult offspring. Now it's interesting to note that the life cycle of Timana nuclear families parallels in some way the life cycle of an individual in that young nuclear families with parents that are not yet highly productive but with an increasing number of, of young dependents that are in, entirely unproductive tend on average to fall in net caloric deficit. Whereas older nuclear families, once parents have, have reached ages of peak productivity, as their children start to be more, become more productive and, and leave the nest, produce uh, on average net caloric surpluses. <coughs> and we can expli explicitly test the predictions of the theory by examining the factors that predict net transfers between nuclear families among the Tsimon A. So this is a, uh, a regression model predicting net transfer from a given older family uh, labeled A to a given younger family labeled B, co-resident in the same community. And what we see is that relatedness is itself an independent predictor of food flows from the, the older to the younger generation. That is, the, the more related the two families are, the, the higher the, the mean genetic relatedness of the two families, the more food will be flowing from the older to the younger generation. We also see support for the predictions from the theory that there is a large negative interaction between the, uh, the uh, relatedness of the two families and the net need of family A. 
So the more that family A has to give, given that they're highly related, uh, they will, there'll be a net flow from A to B. Uh, in the other direction, the needier that, uh, that the recipient family is, if they're highly related, they will receive a, a larger net flow from the other family. So together, relatedness and the life cycle of productivity determine net transfers both between individuals and between families in the Chimane. And as we've heard in the talks yesterday uh, from Ron Lee, uh, from John, from Hilly, uh, net intergenerational transfers are likely to be crucial in driving the evolution of human lifespan, and particularly post-reproductive lifespan. We see in the Chimane sample that net transfers to offspring and grand offspring remain high uh, late into, uh, into adulthood. Um, these transfers tend to decline with senescence at older ages and approach zero around the eighth, eighth decade of life. If we now examine the patterns of mortality in foragers and other small-scale societies, we see that the modal adult lifespan corresponds with this period of net downward provisioning to a remarkable extent which may suggest an adaptive human lifespan of roughly seven decades before the advent of, uh, of modern public health and, and medicine. In this same framework, we can understand the evolution of menopause as a program shutdown of the reproductive system, which allows a shift from direct to indirect reproduction through transfers. Um, and this shift occurs uh, in a period in which uh, an individual is experiencing high levels of surplus productivity, uh, they face high need from their adult offspring and, and grand offspring, and declining reproductive efficiency uh, on the part of, of older women. This uh, slide, which is uh, <coughs> uglier than they'd like it to be, it's not coming out very well, um, uh, it shows the result of, of a thought experiment, of a simulation, uh, which illustrates the crucial economic role provided by post-reproductive men and women uh, in, in Chimani society. The take-home of this thought experiment is that if women were to continue to reproduce into their 50s and 60s, economic production would not be sufficient to cover the costs of the additional dependence. Something in this case would have to give either the fertility of the the younger generation would have to be sacrificed or, or that of the older generation. And it's clear that evolution has favored this latter course. Now, in the second part of this talk, I'd like to turn to relationships between males and females within reproductive unions. So we can, we can situate sex roles among human foragers within a, a more general theory of parental investment and sexual selection in evolutionary biology. This theory is based on the principle that offspring success is a function of two complementary inputs of care uh, or protection uh, on the one hand and energy or food on the other. The result, and we can, we can conceptualize that an individual has a budget constraint <laughs> that limits their ability to invest care and energy in their offspring and that increasing investments of care will trade off against increasing investments in uh, the ability to forage and provide food, either through lactation or, or transfers. Um, and so this is the, a hypothetical budget constraint faced by an individual, uh, say a mother, uh, and this would be the budget constraint in the, in the case that both parents uh, actively contribute uh, to, to offspring success. And under the condition that there are diminishing returns to specialization, either in the production of care or in the production of energy, then selection will tend at equilibrium to favor a mix of uh, simultaneous provision of care and energy, uh, by, particularly by females, um, with desertion uh, and, and basically no parental investment beyond gametes for, for males. That is, for the male, the 
under these conditions that if you have uh, this a, a, a budget constraint of this shape, um, depending upon the, the curvature of the, the fitness function, um, males will tend to, to uh, do better by deserting the, the current offspring and moving on to the next reproductive op opportunity because uh, he's able to basically uh, uh, leave the bill to be paid by, by the mother uh, who's, who's committed to, to caring for the infant and through, through lactation, um, particularly for mammals. Now, if we consider an alternative scenario in which there are increasing returns to specialization in either care or energy production reflected in the shape uh, of, of this uh, budget constraint, the, the equilibrium uh, mating system is, is somewhat different. That is, the selection will tend to favor an equilibrium in which both sexes contribute with specialization and care by one sex and production of energy by the other. And in the, in the case of birds, uh, where uh, monogamy and biparental care are much more common than in mammals, this specialization takes the form of turn-taking, uh, where one individual will guard the nest while the other forages in some other location where food is available. In the case of, of humans, this specialization is, is more complete in that one sex takes on the role of, of providing care and the other sex takes on uh, a role of, of providing energies that's specifically incompatible with providing simultaneous care. So we can summarize the, the uh, sources of complementarity among human foragers is that given that primates generally have a commitment to caring infants, to lactating, and giving intense maternal care, and given that there's a basic incompati incompatibility of giving care and hunting simultaneously due both to the danger to the infant as well as likely uh, decreased return rates if one were to go hunting with, with an infant uh, uh, accompanying. Uh, this creates returns to specialization in alternative skill trajectories. Um, what then do the data look like regarding specialized sex roles in hunter-gatherer societies? We see that males uh, indeed specialize in product, economic production, uh, provisioning of food, uh, particularly in terms of uh, protein uh, and, and fat resources through, through hunting. Um, females also are, can, uh, are, are productive, certainly. Um, the, the economic productivity of, of mothers in particular tends to be in tasks uh, such as gathering that are compatible with simultaneous uh, care for, for young children. Among the, the Ache, for example, women spend more than 90% of their time in tactile contact with infants. This is a, a particularly uh, dangerous environment for, for infants to uh, be on their own and it uh, drives this very close association. Uh, among the Timane, we see that mothers are the, the primary caregivers of children, followed by sisters, fathers, grandmothers, and uh, other kin. We can see the uh, specialization of uh, sex roles and the division of labor uh, by separating uh, productive labor which occurs away from the home, uh, which is clearly dominated by, by Timane males uh, through hunting, fishing, gardening, and, and wage labor. Um, the situation is reversed when you look at productive labor that occurs uh, within the domestic sphere, uh, with a female focus on parenting, uh, household maintenance, manufacture of, of tools and other items, and food processing and cooking. We're able to see the complementary specialization of males and females also in the effects of dependence on the economic behavior of their parents. So the, the presence of offspring that are under three years of age has a discernible uh, negative impact on women's productivity, um, both in terms of the hours that she spends in horticultural work as well as the, the number of calories that she produces per day through horticulture. We see that Older offspring, offspring over the age of three, 
actually have a positive impact on female productivity. Uh, these are the Chinoff type of effects that, that Ron Lee referred to yesterday, um, such that uh, increasing dependent need increases female productivity. You see the same pattern for men in hunting, such that uh, the number of cho dependent children positively predicts both uh, men's time spent in hunting as well as the number of calories that he produces for his family. <coughs> the, uh, the importance of skill in the, the human hunting, uh, hunting and gathering niche uh, is also manifest in male-female relationships. Particularly, we can see here, this, this dashed line shows the return rates uh, from hunting as a function of age among the Ache. And you can see that there is a, a remarkably late peak in hunting efficiency, reflecting the importance of skill acquisition and experience in becoming a proficient hunter. We can again perform a, a thought experiment and ask, given the, the importance of practice and experience in hunting efficiency, uh, and given that women who are, are pregnant and lactating would be unable to perform, to, to gain that experience, that the uh, best strategy for, uh, for women who have this commitment to uh, gestation and childcare is actually to forego hunting and focus instead on, uh, on gathering and other activities that are uh, productive, that require somewhat less skill, uh, and are also compatible with child care. What are the consequences of pair bonding for human demographic patterns? The result is that men and women's age schedules of fertility are linked, um, such that they show a, a, a somewhat similar age pattern with a, a shift to the right for men that reflects the difference in, in age of marriage for, for men and women. Um, and a slightly thicker tail for men, uh, which, which is uh, essentially uh, reproduction through polygynous marriage, usually to, to two women. Um, although rates of, of polygyny among uh, the majority of hunter-gatherer groups are generally less than 10% than of marriages being polygyn polygynous marriages. The other consequence of the, this linkage between male and female reproductive schedules is effective male menopause. These are data that, that John Stieglitz put together from the Timon A, showing that 90% of men whose wives go through menopause do not reproduce again. A small percentage reproduce again, uh, some of them with a, a younger co-wife, 3% uh, go on to uh, uh, reproduce with another woman entirely. Um, but for the vast majority of Timon A men, uh, the wife's menopause means, uh, implies the, the male's menopause as well. Okay, the, the final point of emphasis in this talk is the role of reciprocal relationships among, among both kin and non-kin in shaping the evolution of human life histories. And food sharing in particular is an absolutely critical feature of social life among human foragers no matter which, which society you look at. The ecological factors underlying cooperation and food sharing are, first of all, the, the size of packages that are acquired, uh, reflecting uh, diminishing returns to consumption for uh, a, an individual hunter who, who might think about not sharing a piece of food. Um, the existence of uncorrelated variability or variance in return rates, uh, basically the, the probability that uh, on any given day that you'll come back empty-handed from, from uh, a hunting expedition. Um, those rates tend to be uh, rather high uh, from, from 40 to 90 percent fail rates. Uh, and so by sharing, uh, 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 two individuals or, or a, a risk pooling group are able to smooth consumption rates through time uh, by uh, sharing food with each other when, uh, when they've come back with a shortfall. Um, humans are also able to uh, uh, reap the gains to cooperative acquisition through uh, activities such as group hunting and, and fishing. Um, all of these factors combine to uh, create a, uh, the conditions for reciprocal food sharing in human foraging societies. Um, I think I'll, I'll basically skip this slide except to say that we can see that there's an important 
effect of package size on the, uh, both the, the uh, breadth and, and depth of food sharing, uh, reflecting this uh, ecological pattern. Um, and we see uh, strong cross-cultural evidence for the role of reciprocity in maintaining cooperation in food sharing. Uh, that there is a, a high level of contingency or correlations between the amount that uh, A gives to B and B gives to A controlling for other confounding factors uh, across a, a very large number of uh, forager samples. Bilateral cooperation, reciprocal cooperation, has key impacts on demographic outcomes principally through its effect on survival. And this may have been a, a very important early step facilitating the extension of lifespan and investment in embodied capital, uh, including intergenerational transfers. Um, what I've emphasized in this talk is the modal pattern of social relationships and demography in human foragers. Uh, the fact that it's an ecological theory means that it should yield testable predictions for cross-cultural variation in, uh, based on differences in the age schedule of productivity, in the nature of complementarity between male and female inputs, and the returns to cooperation. Uh, also, particularly after domestication, the importance of uh, controllable and defensible resources uh, can have very large consequences for uh, the, the nature and form of these social relationships. To conclude, I'd like to uh, uh, steal a phrase from uh, Dobzhansky, which is that nothing in human biodemography makes sense except in light of human sociality. Thank you very much. <laughs>